This is video 26 in the Catholic theological tradition, and we've just begun talking about early scholasticism, 12th century, a, a great age of rebirth, the beginnings of the rebirth of medieval civilization, life in the cities, people actually learning to read, to write, to think uh, in a new way, the beginning of building of some pretty awesome cathedrals. But the 13th century is the high point of medieval civilization. There, it's a very special time of synthesis. Um, the papacy is at its height in Innocent III. And Innocent III is most famous for accepting St. Francis of Assisi when Francis shows up in Rome, uh, tattered and in rags with a group of what look like vagabonds. And the, uh, Innocent has a dream the night before Francis shows up. He sees this poor man holding up the church, which is collapsing. He recognizes this man to be the one before him, and he hears from this man that this man has a new vision for religious life. Up until this point, religious life in Europe is mainly Benedictine monasteries. And the Benedictine monasteries are landed properties. And by this time, um, some of them are very rich. They have large lands. And the early monks began by farming and working themselves. Uh, by now, most of the Benedictine monasteries have serfs. People have left land to the monasteries with the servants that go with the land. And now those servants are serving the monasteries, farming the land, producing income. The monks are mainly copying manuscripts, praying and studying. Um, they, they become big enterprises, but they're stable. People you know, live there their whole life. They take a vow of stability to a particular monastery. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's a different kind of a life than the life that Jesus and the apostles lived for three years before Jesus' crucifixion, death, and resurrection. There, you know, there's, this is the idea of religious life, is cloistered monastic life with property, and rather comfortable, quite frankly, in most circumstances. Now, uh, Francis has this crazy idea that he's to own nothing. And his, his people are to own nothing. They are to be mobile. They are to travel like Jesus and the apostles. Live the lifestyle of the gospel, uh, the lifestyle of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, trusting in God's providence, preaching, taking care of the poor. This is Francis's idea. And at the same time, someone else is getting a similar idea, and that is Dominic. Dominic, uh, St. Dominic is from, not Italy like Francis, but from Spain. And he actually is working in southern France trying to convert the Albigensians. And these Albigensians are really a sect, something like the Manichaeans. They're uh, very into poverty, very into um, self-denial. And unfortunately, the monks that were sent first to preach to them are uh, stepping out of nice carriages, wearing um, very elegant clothing. They're very comfortable. And the, the, the people fooled by the Albigensians they just look at these fat cats and say, wow, yeah, the church, yeah, really like Jesus, yeah, uh, yeah, right. Uh, I think I'll go with the Albigensians. So they, they didn't see proof of simplicity and sanctity um, in these Albigensians. And Dominic realizes we must be poor. If we're going to be good teachers and be credible with these people, we have to be in love with Jesus, live simply like Jesus and the apostles. So you have two groups uh, new sorts of religious life, very similar. They met together. They decided they had different charisms, Francis and Dominic. They didn't merge, but they're both a similar new style of religious life called the mendicants. comes from the word to beg in Latin. So they begged for their food they, and they served for free. Um, and they traveled around barefoot, you know, in very simple clothing with nothing. The only difference was the Dominicans, Follow the order of preachers, they were very much from the beginning teachers. St. Francis was not into his guys uh, initially being theologians. The very first theologian allowed by Francis was St. Anthony of Padua. But by the time Francis passes away, um, and this medieval civilization, medieval civilization is growing, something emerges from these cathedral schools, full-blown universities in Bologna, 
uh, this, uh, that, that develops into a university. Um, in in the, Naples, an, a university develops in the city of Naples. Up in France, the cathedral school turns into the University of Paris. And who ends up teaching in these schools? In, in this high tide of scholasticism and medieval culture, it's the Franciscans and the Dominicans, largely. Uh, they're the ones who now are going to push forward um, scholasticism to new heights. And what happens here is there's the rediscovery of the full corpus of Aristotle. There's more things being translated, more things coming from Spain now in, in, in Latin uh, to France, to Italy. And it's now not just the logic of Aristotle, it's his metaphysics and it's his, his physics and his rational psychology on the soul. So there's more stuff coming in. And there's three different approaches to this new corpus of Aristotle. I have to tell you that Aristotle himself, in everything he taught, can't fully be reconciled with Christian faith. For Aristotle, the world is eternal. Uh, it wasn't created, it's always been. So that's a problem right there. And God also is very far away. Uh, he's not an, an intimately involved, personal kind of guy. You know, God is very remote. Um, so there's a number of things with Aristotle that don't fit with the Christian vision. And for that reason, there are some people looking at, at Aristotle who say, um, you know, you, we can't really buy into any of this. This is all new. He's very secular. He's very contrary to the spirit of St. Augustine and very contrary to the spirit of, of the monastic life. You know, it, he's dangerous. So no, we can't use any of Aristotle, this new secular, contemporary, you know, fad. We can't buy into it at all. So there's intransigent traditionalists who are, you know, Augustinian, monastic, they won't touch Aristotle. That's one approach to Aristotle. Now, the other uh, approach to Aristotle is, wow, this is really cool. We, we just need to be with it and go all the way. So there are certain Catholics who we call the Latin Averroists. Averroes, uh, Averroes was a, a Muslim disciple of Aristotle, and he basically so completely embraces Aristotle that he denies really, the creation of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Where Aristotle and the church and its doctrine disagree, then we got to go with Aristotle because he's a new thing. The church doctrine must be wrong and old fashioned. So there are people who sell out the tradition and sell out the scriptures for Aristotle, the Latin of Aroists, okay? So Christ and culture, total no, we will not Inter interact with the culture. We will not listen to any of this new stuff. We will not use any of it. That's one extreme. The other extreme is uncritical, embracing, and selling out the tradition. So what's the critical appropriation that, that happens here? The same thing that we saw with Justin, for example, okay? The critical appropriation approach, we're going to eat the meat and spit out the bones. We're going to take what's useful from Aristotle and we're going to leave behind the things that, that really won't fit with the cross of Jesus Christ and with the revelation that comes to us through scripture and tradition. So who represents that? A Dominican, St. Albert the Great, and his pupil, St. Thomas Aquinas, and a Franciscan, St. Bonaventure, disciple of Francis. Uh, but the next generation, you know, Francis dies in, in about 1223 and the high water mark, you know, of, of, of Aquinas and of, of Bonaventure would be like 1250 and 60 uh, into 1270 kind of time. So let's talk a little bit about Bonaventure. Um, Bonaventure, you're assigned to read a little snippet of Bonaventure so you can get a taste of him. If you're not taking this as a course for credit from Catholic Distance University, go to my website, 
DrItaly.com. Search on Bonaventure. There's a beautiful text or two that you can read, just a page to give you a flavor of Bonaventure. He's used in the Office of Readings, and that's what I have posted on my site, his selections there. Uh, anything in the Office of Readings and the Liturgy of the Hours is obviously approved by the church. The church sees it as very valuable, so that's why it's there. So Bonaventure has a very mystical spirit. He much more is in continuity with uh, the passionate theology of Augustine and approach of Augustine. I mean, St. Saint, Saint Francis is, is all heart. So Bonaventure is all heart. Uh, he's very, he has a great mind, but he, he's very imaginative, very symbolic. All right, now, so he uses Aristotle, but in a very restrained sort of a way. A much more generous use of Aristotle is made by Albert the Great, and especially uh, the greatest theologian of, of the 13th century, St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? So if you read Aquinas and you read the Summa, you'll notice he constantly is talking about the philosopher. Who's he referring to? Not Plato, he's referring to Aristotle. So that's what he's called by Thomas, the philosopher. Um, so he uses Aristotelian distinctions to clarify, to organize and to explain Christian doctrine. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit more in our next video. Thank you.